Hello. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out today. We're going to get started in about five minutes. So if you want to grab a seat or come into this area, um, if you're here for the career panel, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out for our event. Um, this event is in partnership between the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Washington, D.C. and the Society for International Development's Young Professionals Network in Washington, D.C. So we're going to give a little bit of an introduction to these organizations and then I will um, introduce our panelists and we will uh, we will have some discussion on the panel and then at the end we'll open it up to audience questions as well. And Carlia, where's Carlia? Carlia will have the mic if you, uh, if you have questions at the end. So I'm going to let Paul Sherman, he's a senior program manager at SID, tell you a little bit about their organization and the Young Professionals Network. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, my name is Paul Sherman. As Chris said, um, I'm Senior Programs Manager at Sid Washington, um, Society for International Development in Washington Chapter. Um, so we, this is kind of what we do. So our bread and butter, we're a membership and uh, events-based organization. So if, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, we host events like this, type, like this all the time. Um, you know, for the purpose of sharing information and, and networking in the international development space. Um, so we host, you know, a wide variety of events. We host somewhere between, like, usually if it's like an event per week, we host like about, I think, almost 60 events a year. Um, so we have something going on every time, every, like pretty much every, every moment of the day. Um, so check out our website. Um, on the back of the flyer, there's also some of our up, most our upcoming events. I know there's some concerns about um, coronavirus going on right now. Um, we're still moving forward with our events as planned, um, though some of them might get moved online as we move forward. Um, but we're still going to be moving forward with our programming. Um, so if you're interested in anything coming up, just head to our website. That's where everything will be. Um, we'll also be uh, we'll post we will be posting many many more events over the course of the next couple of weeks. So you'll see those come up. Um, and that's enough. And also, too, just plugging our Young Professionals Network. Our co-chairs aren't here tonight, um, but uh, I'm sure they would want me to plug the Young Professionals Network. They do similar types of events with um, mostly kind of like this um, to give you an opportunity, the Young Professionals, an opportunity to uh, network and also kind of more see kind of skill building uh, events. Um, so you see more of those more frequently. So that's enough for me. I'll hand it back to Chris. Thanks, Paul. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Return Peace Corps Volunteers of Washington, D.C., we're actually a 501c3 NGO, um, and we have, we're actually open, it's primarily Peace Corps Volunteers, but you do not have to be a Peace Corps member volunteer to join. Uh, we have Carlia, where's Carlia? Carlia Brown, she's a board member here, and she heads up the professional development activities. So we have this career panel tonight, but she hosts about 20 other career panels a year. And uh, we also have a mentorship program. We have uh, cultural activities. We have volunteering activities. Um, we have a lot of fun stuff. So please check us out if you want to get involved. We're open to anyone, even if you did not serve in the Peace Corps. Uh, if you believe in the principles of Peace Corps, please join us. So a couple order of business. Um, bathrooms are kind of right behind my shoulder, around the corner of the bar back there. Uh, due to coronavirus, we have some hand sanitizer up front, and uh, we just ask that this is you guys network and take advantage of this event, but we just ask you keep it a no handshake event. Um, and I want to get an idea of our audience here so our panelists can have an idea of who you are. How many people are currently working full time in DC in global health already? Can you raise your hand? Okay, great. And how many people are not, but want to be working in global health? Okay, great. I think that's maybe 60-50. Wonderful. Okay. So I'll give you um, a brief introduction to our panelists, and they're going to go more into depth, tell you a little bit how they got where they are in their careers now, some of the lessons le they've learned, and a little bit about what they do. Um, I will start off by introducing myself. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I did rural health development in Kyrgyzstan, and I also worked on HIV AIDS in Ukraine. And I've been working in DC for about three years. I've done a lot of business development as well as uh, consulting. So without further ado, um, we're going to start at the very end with Julie Becker. She is a senior vice president for the global health division at Comonix, and I'm just going to Pass the mic down to her. <laughs> we will use hand sanitizer, I promise. Um, so you want me to go ahead and talk about my background? OK. Um, I thought you were going to introduce everybody, but that's fine. Um, so uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy to be here. I did not uh, uh, go to the Peace Corps, but I often recommend that people do. I think it's a great thing. I've hired and worked with a lot of people uh, who have been in Peace Corps, and um, I'm a big fan. Um, but I got started in a very different way. Um, uh, I, I got started at a very young age when I was still an undergraduate, and I 
was taking a course in medical anthropology and I was really interested in sort of the cultural basis of health and how culture impacts delivery of health services. And it was all very interesting, but it was very academic in those days. Medical anthropology now is much more applied, but in those days it was highly academic. And I just wanted to understand something about how health services are delivered. So, um, so I was a little bit scrappy and I dug up an opportunity. Um, I started asking everybody I know, how can I learn about this? How can I do something to help uh, while learning? And I wound up getting a, um, uh, a, I guess you call it an internship. I volunteered with a uh, clandestine pediatric clinic that was located inside um, of a slum community in California um, that was where primarily undocumented immigrants lived who were afraid to use the healthcare system. And so a pediatrician and a nun got together and put their own money into opening this clinic and they wanted somebody to help them out. So I went there and I translated and I, you know, weighed babies and I checked hematocrits and all sorts of things. And um, it was, I guess what it taught me is it, it taught me about how difficult access to care is. And that's what sort of solidified my idea that I wanted to go into public health. Um, so uh, I applied to grad school and in those days they really didn't want you to go to grad school unless you had at least a year of, you know, real work experience and they sort of discouraged that. So, um, so I got scrappy again. I moved to San Francisco and I, I researched, you know, what were the public health institutions there and I found one called the Institute for Health Policy Studies at UC San Francisco, and they had a Center for Reproductive Health Policy. And I just read about their work and said, okay, this is what I wanna do. I'm really interested in women's health. And um, so how am I gonna get in there? Um, so I, um, I made an appointment and I went and I spoke with them and said I was really interested and I would like to volunteer but I needed, I could only volunteer if I like could find a way to survive. And so, you know, they said, we'd love to have you. We don't have any money. Um, and I went out and I got a job uh, part-time at a hospital doing something related, but not quite public health. Um, I was working in the research division there and it paid the bills and I volunteered at the Institute. And after a few months, they found grant money to pay me. Um, and so I continued working at the hospital and at the Institute and I developed some uh, really highly desirable skills there. So in those days, um, it was at the very beginning of when, I don't know many, if, how many of you have used um, SAS for statistical analysis. So in those days, there were no menus. It was all programming language. And I learned at this place how to program SAS. And when I got to grad school, I was like the only person who knew how to do that. So all of the faculty members wanted to hire me as a research assistant. And um, I managed to get in on the first um, international collaboration on AIDS research uh, that was a collaboration between Harvard and the government of Mexico and uh, worked on the behavioral section of that, analyzing data. And it was an amazing experience and I got my foot in the door internationally. And um, it was sort of the start of a very long career that for many years focused on HIV, but also on women's health looking at the intersection of HIV and women's health. Um, and I wound up, you know, I worked very briefly domestically, but I wound up working for a series of different NGOs uh, at, at the intersection of women's health and HIV. I, it was really easy for me to get jobs in those days because not only did I have SAS skills, but um, uh, very few people at that time had HIV experience because it was very early in the epidemic. And, um, so I guess I'm telling you the story because I think it's really important to uh, figure out an area of knowledge or a skill that's in high demand and going to be in high demand. Um, and that's how I was able to really almost have my pick of jobs at one point um, uh, because there were very few other people had that. So I'll talk a little bit more later about what I think some of those, um, those skills might be, uh, but um, uh, I guess I'll leave it there for now. I, I'm not seeing any time, time card. No, a little bit about oh, there it is. <laughs> Who can find you? Am I over time? Okay. Well, I'm talking about what you're doing now. Okay. So I am brand new at Chemonix. I started two months ago um, and I'm heading up the Global Health Division. Um, I, I came most recently from a global health consulting firm where I worked for the last 
eight years or so um, working uh, as a consultant with the private sector and with the Gates Foundation on a variety of global health issues. And so um, I'm just learning chemonics. It's a very large and uh, complex place. Um, and there are some jobs, www.chemonics.com. <laughs> I asked today if there are open jobs, and there are, including some at entry level. So um, uh, I hopefully will be working with some of my colleagues to um, figure out how to take the global health division and grow it in new directions and um, uh, hopefully have greater and greater impact. So. so next up we have Christine Better. She's an astrophysicist. Hi, good evening everyone. So how did I get into global development? Well, quite differently. I grew up in a really small town, a village as you'd say in Africa of less than 2,000 people. And I felt like I didn't belong there. So I spent a lot of my time looking at a, a world map and looking for the most small and obscure places in the world, like the South Sandwich Islands or the Kingdom of Lesotho and thinking how interesting it would be to travel to those places. And the only person that I knew in this community of 2000 people that had a passport was my grandfather, who I learned in later life with a spy, but we won't have that discussion now. That's a whole separate <laughs> one. So um, as I grew up, I decided to, I went to college and I took any class that had the word international is it, in it, but I still didn't know what a, what a career looked like because it, was, it wasn't at that point in time a really sexy thing to do. International development didn't really exist as a career that people knew about. Angelina Jolie hadn't yet discovered it. So, um, so it, took some, it took really some sleuthing to really figure out what this was and how to do it. So after undergraduate, I decided I wanted to join Peace Corps. So I went through and I did the application and they called me with an opportunity, but I'd had a death in the family and the nice woman at the other end of the phone said, well, thank you very much, but we're gonna have to disqualify you for a year because you're unstable because you've had a death in the family. Thank you very much, call us back in a year. And as a young person, you're very, you're very, um, you want to move forward so quickly that you're just not willing to wait a year and put your life on hold while Peace Corps kind of waits for you to feel like you're stable. So I started applying to graduate schools and looking to get some experience and I was lucky enough to get accepted at Columbia where I did the joint degree in um, international affairs at SIPA and then while I was there also joined the School of Internet School of Public Health and got a joint degree there and studied French which we'll, we'll come back to at some point and say learn French um, and then graduated and was thrilled when, when I graduated with two degrees from an Ivy League university and, was, and someone wanted to pay me $15 a day plus housing and um, health insurance to go to Togo. I thought I'd won the lottery. Um, and in retrospect, I actually had. So I worked for Catholic Relief Services at that point in time, even though I'm an atheist. Um, it was a great job. And then worked for a series of organizations. I worked with refugees and built a career in public health, working in um, conflict zones um, in fragile states. Um, actually raised a family while working in post-conflict um, environments. Spent 17 years of my life living in Africa, Eastern Europe, in the, um, in the Balkans. And three years ago, moved back to the US to take a job with Apt Associates, where I'm a managing director for West Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Speak French, it was always the, I always got the next step up in my career because I had a skill other people didn't or other people that were competing for the similar position didn't have. So I would agree with my, my colleague here, Julie, that do something that other people don't. Anyway, more later. Next up, we have Carly Claiborne. He's the global head of health practice for Palladium. Thanks. Um, I'm a lot older than most people here. I, start, I graduated from medical school in 1982. And in 1982, we were just seeing, I was in London, we were seeing uh, a new disease. It was caused by a virus called HTLV-1. And I got some funding to go back to Trinidad, where I was born, to start a service for this virus, which causes leukemia, and also a, a neurological disease. And while I was doing that, with NIH funding, uh, we, of course, all experienced a huge increase in another new disease, which was called AIDS. And so I started seeing AIDS patients way back in the mid-80s. And the collaboration that I had with 
the NIH. Tony Fauci was there, would you believe? He started in 1984, and this was in the mid 80s. So I met Tony Fauci in 1984. Um, uh, I was offered a fellowship to come to the NIH in 1988, which I accepted. And so I ended up at NIH as a scientist, an intramural scientist. You know, NIH is a lot of extramural and a smaller intramural. And I was there from 1988 to 1995 when, uh, and I was working with Robert Gallo. I know some of you may know who that is. He was the co-discoverer of the HIV virus. And he retired from the public health service and uh, moved to and uh, start a new institute at the University of Maryland called the Institute of Human Virology. And I moved with him. So I was, I had a long academic career at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Actually, uh, the current head of the CDC was also part of that team, Bob uh, Redfield. And Debbie Burks and I were co-fellows. Uh, it was a joint fellowship between the uh, Naval Hospital and the NCI. It was the only AIDS fellowship in the world at the time. And so when I was at Maryland, of course, I spent a long time doing international work, trying to describe not only the extent of HIV in the world, but also the impact of HIV in the world. So we, we used to say we were bench to bedside. We did basic science, we did clinical science, and we did epidemiology and public health. And so we were part of the discussions uh, for starting PEPFAR. And our group was one of the first four awardees. It was called PEPFAR Track One. And if you remember, that was in 2004. And uh, PEPFAR stands for the President's Emergency Plan for HIV AIDS. It was started by George W. Bush. It was a bilateral congressional uh, appropriation to extend the benefits of treatment to the rest of the world because we had it here. And it was a great thing and it's still a great thing. And um, that changed my life because I left my academic practice uh, at the University of Maryland Medical Center and I moved to the organization I am still with. It wasn't called Palladium then, it was called Futures Group. And I can tell you the story of how Futures Group became Palladium, maybe later on. And at Palladium, uh, where I've been for the last, since 2004, 16 years, um, I uh, am the global head of health practice. Now, what does that mean? It means that health for us, we are a global organization. We operate in 90 countries. USAID is our largest client. But we also have huge clients elsewhere, like the British government, the Australian government, uh, multilateral institutions. Health is our largest practice. It's about 60% of the organization. And we operate uh, everywhere. So uh, as global head of health practice, my uh, objective is to implement, to first of all, win projects that are important, that will have impact, uh, that we will execute with excellence and complete the cycle of learning and adaptation to improve the population health around the world, essentially. And that is a, a job that we can talk about. It has many facets, but I, I still get to be the doctor. I'm an infectious disease doctor. I still get to be, uh, I get to be a manager. I also get to be a mentor to young people. And we do have a lot of jobs open at Pall Palladium all the time. So come on over, check it out. Pleasure to be here. Um, so, what's what's my path been um, to get where I am today? Um, and I actually I wear a couple of hats. This is one of my titles. The other title is I'm the 
um, USAID agency lead for the US President's Malaria Initiative, um, an initiative that came a few years um, after PEPFAR, also launched um, by former President Bush, but um, I'll talk about PMI maybe in, in a little bit, but maybe talk about my journey first. Um, so how many RPCVs do we have in the Awesome. All right. So I'm a RPCB as well. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer um, in the early 90s in Senegal. Um, before I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I my undergrad was in nursing. Um, I worked as a cardiology nurse for a couple years. I had had a um, teacher when I was a senior in high school, my math or, or um, calculus teacher who um, it, who had been one of the early Peace Corps volunteers um, in the early days, and he spoke about his experience that really sort of caught me wanting to um, experience the same thing. But I thought that I would go, you know, join the, I, I was, I'm, there's at least one person in the audience who actually works on my team who knows I'm, I'm a fairly practical person. Um, so I thought, okay, I'd work for a couple years, solidify my nursing skills. I'd go in the Peace Corps for, Peace Corps for a couple of years, and then I'd return and, and go right back into clinical nursing because I, I actually loved my training in, in clinical nursing and, and um, figured I re I'd return. Um, and I didn't leave nursing to go to the Peace Corps because I didn't like nursing. I went to sort of have that cross-cultural experience to use my health background to be a public health volunteer um, in West Africa, but Peace Corps um, totally got me focused on, on public health. Um, so I um, finished two years. Um, I returned back home for two months and returned back to Senegal to train the next group of volunteers. I'd been asked um, towards the end of my service if I'd be willing um, to, to return and, and um, I plan, so I did. I applied to grad school while I was um, back training the next cohort of volunteers, got accepted into grad school, returned in, um, from, from training and, and ended up um, pursuing a dual master's, a master's in um, community health nursing and, and international public health. Um, and decided to stay focused for a stretch um, in local public health in the US. I thought I'd give that a try. Um, I also had been, you know, in and out of, um, you know, I'd been gone for a while for my family and I decided that staying I'm from Seattle and I was getting my, um, I got my master's out at University of Washington. I um, landed a wonderful job at the Seattle King County Public Health Department. I was the um, refugee and immigrant TB program director where I saw patients, you know, two and a half days a week and then ran the program that included community health workers, um, almost um, a very almost global program with East, you know, uh, refugees and immigrants from all around the world, but primarily from East Africa and um, Southeast Asia. I did that for a few years, taking a couple of leaves of that absence to um, do some international consulting um, with the CDC and um, with Doctors of the World in Kosovo and elsewhere, where I take um, six weeks of a time, time away, um, and decided with that um, experience that I wanted to get back um, more permanently into the, the global health space. And so I um, saw a fellowship position, a term limited position at USAID to work on the TB team. And I um, was successful at that, that uh, application. My husband and I moved um, to DC. Um, and then the President's Malaria Initiative got started about three years later. And just as it was getting going, they needed um, strong managers, good, good, you know, people had already you know, come in junior and, and proven themselves to be good collaborator, collaborators and, and I guess at the time considered sort of a rising leader. And I got asked um, one of a couple of people to move over. Um, and then I have worked on the initiative ever since. So from 2006 um, until now and then risen to 
the the um, chief of the I'm the lead agency civil servant for the initiative. I work under the political leadership appointed by the president, and and feel every day that I have a privilege to work on this amazing um, public health effort. Great. So next up, we have Joyce Page. She is president and executive director of the Global Health Council. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Hi. How are we feeling? It's weird, right? Like, can we just say it's weird right now? <laughs> I, mean, I work in this space. I think we've been doing it for a long time, and um, um, I'm just happy to say, happy to see you guys all here, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with you, frankly. I think in moments like this, too, I try to be human and kind of stand in solidarity um, with everyone around me. So for what it's worth, that's what I'm keeping in mind. I don't have any sage wisdom <laughs> really in this moment except to breathe and to wash your hands <laughs> but um as chris said i'm lois uh, i head up um global health council which is an advocacy coalition here in dc i want to say maybe i'm the only i'm sure we're all advocates in our own right but i think i have that title um up here on this panel and uh ghc is a is an interesting organization um because it brings together um, a range of issues and stakeholders. I like to say we cover everything from AIDS to Zika. Uh, and we work with a number of organizations, a lot of implementing organizations like those here on this panel, some corporations, um, some uh, academic institutions, and really just shine a light on the work that they do. You know, we, we see people like everyone here and all of you doing good in the world. And I think our job here in Washington is to make sure you all are in a position to do more good in the world frankly. And how do we do that? We're talking to people in power and we're talking to people here in DC, in New York, at the UN, in Geneva, at the World Health Organization and saying, look, this is what's happening. And these are the people who can work with you to do, to help get this job done. It's a big job we all have to do when it comes to global health. We have some pretty big lofty goals. Um, and so the more that we work together, the more effective we can be. So I like my job for that reason, because you guys make me look good. Thank you. Uh, I want to introduce um, Hayab, who's here with me. Um, especially because she's an RPCV and so she keeps me honest in this space. I was smart enough to hire one of you. Uh, we don't have any openings right now, but uh, rest assured that if we do, we'll be looking this way. Um, hey, it's been great in her role. She's only been with us for a few months, um, but she can, I think, talk fluently about what we do when you, we start networking a little bit later. Um, but I guess I'll get into how I got here as everyone else has done, except I'll, I'll stretch us a little bit and work backwards. Uh, so let's see, before I stepped into this immediate role, um, or immediately before I stepped into this role, I should say, uh, I was not actually a policy person. And that's a strange thing in this town to be someone who goes to the White House, goes to the Hill, and really not have come up in that space. Um, I, was, I was a program person and uh, actually uh, started a number of programs throughout Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa working in cancer. And so that's something else that's uh, less unique now, but it's it's not really a common path um, when it comes to global health. Because when I started, I mean, I hate to say this, Julie, but USAID was still funding tobacco farmers <laughs> in the region, you know, and there was a reason for that, right? There was it was an economic development opportunity, um, but we had a really hard time convincing people, even in the global health space, um, that cancer and non-communicable diseases were important to pay attention to and and kind of deserved some sort of space here in the work that we do. Now that's everyone's bought into it. Um, but that made my job very interesting at the time, really kind of spreading the gospel of cancer and NCDs. And there were a lot of important connections that we made to HIV, for example, and obviously maternal and child health issues and whatnot. Um, um, but it was, it was, as other people have said, it was kind of cool to cut my teeth on something different and new and that um, others hadn't really tackled just yet. And, and importantly, work with people on the ground um, to understand how they were facing those issues without uh, robust resources like we were seeing at the time through PEPFAR and PMI. Um, so that was a big lesson learned. Um, right before then, um, I um, actually, though, um, paid my dues and worked for Catholic Relief Services, although I am also not Catholic. <laughs> and uh, and that, was, uh, that was really interesting. I was one of I think about 25 or so fellows at the time, most of whom had gone through Peace Corps and they, I'll come back to some of what I heard as to what made me more qualified to do that work, but I'm grateful that they took a chance on me um, and assigned me to, um, to West Africa at the time to work on very traditional global health issues. And I think that was a really good foundation for me. 
But really, um, my ultimate foundation was working domestically. And I'm, it's very interesting that a few of us have pointed to that as an experience um, that, we, um, that we started at home. Uh, and in my case, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and in the 80s, and it was, I don't, you know, you, we've all seen the movies, it was not a good time. Uh, and it was really important for me to um, do something in my community. Um, and in that regard, that was really focusing on health. And it was really looking at health as a justice issue and as an equity issue. Um, and I can get into sort of the kind of work I was doing on the ground. But um, eventually, I came to understand that that was something that connected people across the country and around the world. Um, and it really motivated me to pursue that work um, globally. And I, and I still include the US as part of that. And I still very much have interest in and tend to sort of float between international and domestic work. So I think that'll be a, an important part of our discussion tonight and maybe an important part of our, your pursuits later. Um, but, I'm, but I'm very grateful for that experience and that grounding. And I'm looking forward to having um, more conversations about that this evening. Thanks, Chris. So we have, a, we have a pretty good representation of people who are managing and implementing some very large global health programs, US government perspective, and a policy advocacy perspective. So hopefully everyone walks away tonight learning something new from this panel. Um, we're going to have some unique questions for each panelist, but we're also going to have some questions that I ask everyone. So we're going to start off with a question for everyone, and that is, what skills have you found useful as you've progressed in your career, and or what skills do you recommend people develop? What are you looking for when you're hiring people? What advice do you have uh, in that area? So we'll start with Lois and work our way down. Um, I'm a people person and I like people people. Um, it's not to say other technical skills aren't important. I have an MPH myself, um, but I just find in the work that I do, especially now that I'm focused more on advocacy, it's, it's about those soft skills and I hate to sound cliche, um, but I think those are things that at least um, I wasn't able to learn uh, in, uh, through academic training. So I think focusing on that um, you know, outside of formal institutions is really, really important. And it's, it's everything from networking and learning how to connect dots across people and resources um, to really just being intuitive um, about what people's needs are. There's a, there's a refrain I remember someone teaching me, which is what's in it for them. You know, there's often we show up in situations and it's like, what's in it for me? What do I have to get down? But, but what's in it for, for the other person? And especially in this work, we have to be thinking about the people we're, we're supposedly serving um, and, and putting them in the driver's seat and putting them in the decision seat um, when it comes to the work that we do. So yeah, I think it's focusing on people. So everything Lois said. <laughs> no, in, in, in all seriousness, and I won't be surprised if, if everyone sort of zones in on this, I, it, you can learn the technical in any position you get hired for. Obviously, you need to have a little bit of uh, if, if entry level. You, you learn that technical or management program um, component, but it's really those soft skills. It's that ability to listen, um, to effectively communicate, to be able to sort of meet someone where when you're not necessarily agreeing, to be able to figure out, okay, where, where's the other person coming from? How do we actually get to a place where we're able to partner and collaborate and, and solve um, a problem and, and move forward together? Um, I, I, it's been alluded to already is, is language skills, if you want a career in global health, are phenomenally important. Um, it, it is, the francophone, it's the lucophone skills that actually, um, when the playing field is is fairly level and there's lots of um, you know MPH uh, graduates out there looking for the same position, those language skills are what will will rise you to the top. So, um, I'll I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, I think you're getting some kind of uh, idea that we're looking for the whole person. We're looking for people who have a technical skill. There's no question about that. It's very important to do. But we also want your soft side, as, as Lois said, and your business side. We want you to be able to manage. We want you to understand the finances of what we do. You know, we have a very tough client here who gives us a small amount of money, and we have to program that money very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, no, it's not small. 
But um, the, the point is, if you can't manage every dollar of that money, then you get into trouble. And we don't want you to get into trouble. And we certainly don't want the organizations to get into trouble. Uh, so we're looking for people who can move between these parts of their authentic selves, you know, in an agile way. And we will support that. So we don't want you to be too unidimensional. Um, as I said, you must have a technical skill. That's generally where you start. The language skill is really important. And of course, country experience. And, and this is the great thing about Peace Corps volunteers because uh, in, in Palladium, no exception, I'm sure, about half of our people are Peace Corps people. And, and we have people who were there from the very start of the program. They haven't retired yet. <laughs> um, so, I think you're getting the sense that we want all of you, as opposed to part of you. So, I'm going to take us perhaps a little bit different. Apps um, doesn't have as large a workforce as um, Palladium or Humanics, and we do not frequently have openings. Um, so, it's much harder to get um, an, an opportunity at Apt at an entry level. We don't have very many entry level positions. Um, so when I hire someone, I'm very unlikely to hire someone who doesn't have a language skill. And Spanish doesn't count as a language skill. Um, so when you grow up, I mean, I know your parents said, learn Spanish, it's so helpful. Yes, if you're doing domestic work in the U.S., it is helpful. But in global health, it's not, uh, at least for the work that we do. So even if you're, the job I'm hiring you for doesn't require language skills, I'm unlikely to hire you if you only speak English. Because even though the job itself may not require it, other jobs that we might want to promote you into do require it. So French is the, mo is the language I'm most interested in. But if you have other skills um, like Arabic or other things that um, would be the second, those are the two that I'm probably most interested in. But um, Portuguese is also very helpful. Um, so that would be my first word of advice. So if you don't, if you aren't already fluent in French or studying it, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and my second thing that I hire for is writing skills. Um, you write different things at different points in life. Um, so for example, we have our entry level staff doing a fair bit of business development, working on proposals, and that requires good writing skills. And interestingly, it's something that is really hard to do. Um, it's not the same kind of writing that you do in university or you do in other fields. It's being very concise um, and being able to take a lot of ideas and express them very well in a very few words. So we hire for writing skills. Sometimes we do writing tests, but and no matter where you are in your career, it's important. As I was telling um, someone in the audience, um, I spent about 80 hours last week myself um, work, working on packaging something um, where I was submitting something and I was taking the work of a team and packaging a strategic idea. And I spent, me, the, the most senior person on the team, working on packaging something in, in 20 pages that was really, it wasn't business development, it was redoing something that we were already doing. And I had to take everyone's ideas and put them together and put forth a strategic vision. So, and that's all writing. So that's something you do at an entry level, at a mid level and a senior level. So while well, you may think that, you know, a couple phrases and in an Instagram post is important, it is. A couple of phrases on Twitter, doing it well, important, it is. But being able to write well at two pages, five pages, or 20 at any, any level of your career is really important. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm often hiring for at APT Associates or when I worked for International Rescue Committee or Malaria, or Malaria Consortium. Those are the kind of things I hired for and tested for. Um, I wanted to go back to this issue about technical skills and um, what Julie said about, you know, you can learn the technical skills. And that's true, but I guess I wanted to break that down a little bit because what I've found is that a lot of people come in and they have a lot of theoretical knowledge. They've learned stuff in school or they've learned stuff on the job, but what they're missing is the program skills, or what I might refer to as program skills, which is how to apply those skills in the countries where we work in a real world situation. And, you know, I guess I would encourage everybody to look for those opportunities to really get hands on. 
And I was very lucky early in my career to have had those opportunities, not only to, um, you know, to do real hands-on work um, in a variety of countries, but also to learn from some of the people in those countries who had been doing this sort of thing for years and years and had tremendous knowledge. And I think sometimes we forget that those are some of the most important people for us to learn from. And it's not just about bringing them knowledge or bringing them, you know, offering them our skills, but uh, how can we get ourselves there to, to learn? And just, it just came up today, as a matter of fact, and I was talking about how I learned about quality improvement. And I remembered that when I was first exposed to it, I was exposed to uh, um, a model that had been developed by uh, a Kenyan woman and somebody from my organization who also lived in Kenya. And they had developed one of the first sort of participatory quality uh, improvement models that now have sort of become the standard in the field. And it was all done in Kenya. And I never would have learned it if I had just been, you know, stuck at headquarters. So, um, so I encourage you to get out there and get that hands-on technical experience. So I, I think it's important to, to mention that I think a lot about systems thinking and I, and I, when I talk to people who are coming up after we have all come up <laughs> through school, I think there are more opportunities to actually have, uh, I guess, more integrated training. Um, and I look for that for what it's worth. So, so when I worked in the field, I think it was really important to have, you know, like have a skill or a thing that would open the door for me, but more and more, especially working in Washington, especially if you're thinking about a career on the Hill, right, or in policy, I think it is important to be a generalist and to be able to have a 10,000 foot view and not just be a thinker and tinker, but really like look across all of our various issues um, and, and understand how they're all connected. So I, I felt like it was important to say because I don't know if I was best suited for like that core technical area that people were trying to force me into. And I've done just fine, or okay, I haven't done just fine. But, <laughs> um, and so I, you know, for what it's worth, I think that is also welcome in the space, although it might not be as apparent um, from the jobs that you see online. Those types of roles are out there for you. You have to be a bit more creative and you kind of sort of fall back into them, but I think they're available. Thanks, Lois. So we'll move into some of the individual questions for panelists. And uh, as I was kind of prepping people and discussing this panel, I said, what questions don't want you, do, don't you want me to ask? And I had given them a list of questions. And um, Christine said, don't ask me the networking question. I am an introvert. And, uh, and then she went on to tell me all of the amazing networking things that she's done. And, you know, she has one of the most senior positions in the world and manages millions of dollars of programs. So I'm going to ask Christine to share us, share with us some of her secrets for networking for introverts. <laughs> so I am an introvert. For people who know their Myers-Briggs type, I'm an INTJ. Um, and so I do not belong to any associations. I've never joined anything. I've never been a brownie, a Girl Scout. I've never been on a sports team, so I'm not a joiner. Um, so, but um, I recognize that to get ahead, you do kind of have to know people and you have to get along. Introverts actually do get on with people. They just don't kind of seek out things like that. Um, and I do, I manage a, a portfolio of half a billion dollars. So, so yeah. I, so the um, so secrets for networking um, as an introvert, um, I could never like come to an event like this and kind of walk away with like, you know, a hundred cards and be like, oh, I'll call all these people. Um, and I'm, thank I'm always thankful that I got married before internet dating because I could never have done that. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> so secrets for, so one of the things I do really well is um, I really make the most of my alumni connection. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I went to Columbia. So I have a very close group of friends from my days at Columbia that I've maintained. And I have one degree of separation from all those people and all of their friends. And so, for example, when I wanted to change jobs or I've been open to changing jobs. And so <clears throat> actually my current job, for an example, 
um, I was living in Uganda and I saw the posting for this job. And you don't just submit your CV, but it's not like I'm gonna come and network, like, you know. So um, I looked at the job and I thought, hmm, well, who do I know that knows someone at Apt Associates? I don't want someone to get me the job. I know things don't work that way. So I looked at the job and I kind of thought, okay, well, who in my network knows somebody? So I realized that one of my close friends from school, Megan Smith, who's the principal at Banyan Global, um, was my, one of my close friends at Columbia. I'm like, oh yeah, she knows Susan Mitchell, who's a vice president at APT. I'll talk to Megan and Megan will send my CV to Susan, who will, who will then, then send my CV to the HR recruiter who will just pull it to the top of the pile. That's not really a favor. It's just saying, look at the CV. No one's doing me really a favor other than saying, oh, look at this one. Because the HR people really don't know. I'm not anti-HR people, but they really don't know what they're looking at. And they're just pulling it to the top of the pile. So that's how I got the, that's how I got the first interview for this job. Um, my previous job was a similar kind of thing. Like I knew someone when I got my job, I was living in the US and I wanted to be a country director. So I wanted, I saw a job in Burundi with being the country director of International Rescue Committee. I'm like, oh, I really want that job. And I applied, nothing happened. I sent the note in to be the random HR box, nothing happened. And, okay, well, who do I know it? Who do I know at IRC? Well, I didn't know anyone, but then I remembered someone at my job at Catholic Relief Services knew someone who, and I kind of worked my network of friends and acquaintances with whom I was already kind of comfortable and kind of got my CV to be looked at by someone. So as, as an introvert, you can kind of work your connections with people whom you know and are comfortable, who will just get your CV in the right place, which is also just a comfortable way of introverts to network. Uh, so we're going to go to Lois next, and uh, we're going to ask you to share a little bit about your experience as a woman of color working in the global health development space, and any advice you have for someone in a similar situation. How much time do I have? <laughs> There's your timekeeper right there. <laughs> it's super easy. Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, so... Um, you know, when I think, it's interesting for me to think about how I identify walking into this world and then how people see me. Um, so one of the, I think it's fair to say, challenges I've had working internationally um, has been wrapping my head around folks looking at me and saying, oh, there's an American or there's a Westerner and plugging me in this way that I think Americans or Westerners are viewed around the world. Um, not recognizing all the nuances that I think we hold here as like Trinidadian Americans or African Americans or what have you. Um, and that was, that's been, that was very humbling and that happened early on. Um, I think as a CRS fellow living in West Africa, for example. Um, but it was really important for me to acknowledge um, that I, that, that there wasn't necessarily a difference people saw between me and, and other folks. Um, I, I think on the other hand, at walking into rooms, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how it feels to walk into rooms as the only person of color or the only woman or the only both of those things. And I think we've seen movements um, such as um, people of color in development or women in development or women in global health that have really pointed to this as an issue. And I think it's really encouraging to look around this room and see a higher degree of diversity than people saw 20, 40 years ago. Um, still at leadership levels, I think it's a challenge and um, something that uh, there are a number of folks trying to change and be mindful of. Um, and, and why is it important? I don't think we're just chick checking a box in terms of diversity and inclusion, but there's a really important perspective that I think people like me bring to the table that is different. So, you know, me being able to speak to um, not just an experience, um, sort of not just showing up um, in a village or a situation for the first time and really saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know people could live this way and you know, teach me what you have, you know, teach me what, what, what I can learn. It's like, yeah, actually I have seen that. And there are a number of other people who have, who have come from this country or from elsewhere who have experienced that and 
they're sort of hidden and people don't really realize or recognize um, that, that shared or direct experience that we can have coming into this space. Um, and so for what it's worth, I try and sort of talk about that pretty openly. I'm not very good at it, as you can tell. So I kind of stumble because it's, I, I am also an introvert, surprisingly. <laughs> um, but um, the degree to which I can lift up these voices and ensure that there are varied perspectives at the table and in the room and not just sort of a global south, global north dichotomy, which is problematic in a number of ways. Um, but also we're allowing for that diversity on both sides of the table. Um, that's what we try to do. hope that makes sense. Thank you, Lloyd. Okay, so we're going to jump down to the other end of the table um, and go to Julie Becker. So for people who are, they already have their foot in the door, they're entry level, they're kind of mid level, but they're interested in really uh, gaining, getting into a leadership role in global health. What advice would you have for them? So Julie has had a lot of success for this. <laughs> you want time to think about it? We can come back to you. Um, I was just commenting that she'd given us some of the questions in advance and that wasn't one of them. But <laughs> um, so getting into a leadership role. So I guess one thing I wanted to say that's sort of related to this question, and I'll get more to the point of the question in a minute, is that one thing that I think a lot of people struggle with as they progress in their career is this question of, you know, am I a technical person or am I a management person? And the, pe the field tends to put people in these silos. And quite often the structures are such that people who are technical feel that they cannot progress into higher and higher levels unless they take on management. And I think there, I've seen a little bit of movement toward trying to see technical as a parallel track to management so that people can grow in a technical role and get to higher and higher levels but it's, it's not as common as it should be. And I think what often ends up happening is people who are really good technically try to do this management stuff and they really don't like to do it and they're not very good at it. And um, they end up sort of self-defeating in that regard. So I guess I would just encourage you to be aware of wherever you're looking or wherever you are, be aware of whether you, know, you can grow uh, in more than one of those silos. And um, I think it's, it's really important before you take a job to know, if I'm a technical person, am I gonna be able to grow without becoming a management person? Um, some people do both well. I've, I've done both throughout my career. I think I'm probably a better technical person than I am a management person. Uh, but the fact that I've had both, I think has helped me get to where I am. Uh, the other thing that's helped me get to where I am is just being around a really long time um, <laughs> and sticking with it. You know, as you heard, I've been working in this field, you know, pretty much since always, at least since, um, since I was a college student and I haven't really deviated from that. Um, you don't have to work in this field forever. I mean, there are people who I've seen come in from, you know, change careers in the middle of their career and come in and bring a, a really important skill set that people who have grown up in global health don't necessarily have and be able to apply that skill set um, in new ways. And that's another way uh, to come in uh, at a higher level and to be able to um, get to higher levels within an organization. And sometimes, you know, frankly, people come into a field um, brand new and they think they know everything and they really don't. And you know they sort of dismiss all of the knowledge those of us who have been in this field forever and ever have, and they end up not succeeding. Um, uh, it's terrible when they actually do succeed, but um, <laughs> right, drive us nuts in the process. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks for winging it, Julie. <laughs> um, and Christine, I'm also an INTJ, so thank you for your advice. See? Um, so I have a similar question for Farley and Julie Wallace, but I want to get some different perspectives. So there was some recent research that came out from the American Public Health Association. And to sum it up, there are significantly more people graduating 
from MPH programs than there are jobs. So it's a very competitive environment. So I want to get from Julie some advice on for people who are in, in that environment, how they can be more competitive, and especially if you're interested in working for the federal government. And then I want to get from Farley what advice he would have for people who are looking at implementing organizations. Thank you. Um, so we are hiring. Um, and so working for USAID, there's a couple of different ways that we hire. We hire um, direct, what are called sort of um, federal employees through a competitive direct hire process. Those, those positions are much fewer and far between and, and be happy to talk to folks after to explain why that is. Um, but the large majority of um, those that come into the, the Global Health Bureau and, and other parts of the agency um, come in through what we call contract positions. So they, um, they'll come, we have different um, mechanisms that hire personnel and place them at USAID. The people who, who get hired in that way have USAID.gov email, security clearances, are um, inherently part of the team, no different other than where they get their paycheck. Um, and there might be some legal parameters of those who are civil servants have to do the signing and, and whatnot. But in any case, I give that background because I have, we have, I think, 15 positions at different levels right now out on the streets. Um, only a couple of those are the civil servant. Most of them are the, the um, uh, contract mechanism. Um, I do, and we don't always have that many out on the street, but I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of hiring in my position and have over the years. And um, I'm getting getting to the, the question, um, the answer in the question. Um, this is really practical, but it, it amazes me how many really, really, really qualified people who look so great on paper do not do their homework for their interviews. Um, I think some people might do some homework and think, oh, what are the, some of the standard questions you get asked and, you know, be ready to say why you want the job and what are your qualifications, etc. But one of the first questions I always ask, um, our panels ask is, you know, you, you talk for a second, do introductions, talk for a second about the, the job itself, but then you shift into sort of a little bit of background on USAID and the President's Malaria Initiative. But instead of providing that background, asking the interviewee, you know, saying, you know, I don't want to be redundant what you already know, um, just maybe want to give you some background, but before I do, could you let, let us know sort of what you know, what your familiarity is with the President's Malaria Initiative and the Global Health Bureau at USAID? You would be surprised how many people cannot do the basics of the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative. It is all over the web. It's been there since 2006. <laughs> Every annual report, it's, you can, I mean, you can Google it. You just, even the very basics. So I guess my, my words of wisdom, to be competitive, you got to do your work. There's a lot of, um, I probably get 50 um, qualified applicants for every position that we, we hire. And it's hard enough screening through those those great applications, you know, the, the cover letter and the CVs. But then if you lose it at the first question out of the gate, um, you're, it's hard to get another chance. Um, so just do your, do your research, do the background effort to be as prepared as you can. And then when you get asked the question, one last thing, when you get asked the question sort of why do you want the position, make sure to link it to what value you're going to add to the organization sort of what not just i think this will be great to advance my career but what is the hook what is the thing you can bring that's going to make the organization stronger that's going to help usaid and the president's malaria initiative have greater impact save more babies save more children um think in terms of sort of make those sitting around the table understand what it is that that you bring um, and make them want to walk out of the room and say, I want to hire this person. Thanks. Um, by the way, introverts can train themselves to be extroverted. They just need recovery time. 
<laughs> Sometimes a long recovery time. Um, so it's it's a really um, complex and dynamic situation with regard to hiring in this sector, I would say. You know, when I started, it was a long time ago, we, we had large headquarters uh, staff numbers. Um, and even though, for example, we, there are three of the biggest health implementers sitting at this table, our headquarters staff have sometimes shrunk because we've had to change the balance of how we hire so that we're putting much more of the effort in the field where we're implementing and less of the effort at headquarters. Um, we used to, in fact, futures used to be entirely technically driven. My job used to be called chief technical officer, the chief knowledge officer. But we've had to break down those barriers and blend things a little more to meet the demands of the marketplace. And, and so what you're looking for, even with growing organizations, and we are hiring, um, we're always hiring, uh, you, you need to be able to rise to the top of the pile. As Christine said, she had a diabolical way of doing that using her <laughs> network. You've got to find your own diabolical way of getting to the top of the pile. And standing out, you know, Julie says you've got to do your homework. Well, if you don't do your homework, you're not going to get very far. All of you have a unique set of skills. At the same time, uh, a master's degree is a minimum requirement to do this work. And, and therefore, you, you have to be open. Um, you have to really excite us. And, and we're going to invest in you, invest in you uh, if we make the decision to hire you. We're not hiring grunts. We don't need grunts. We need people that will rise into the organization and become leaders. That's what we want. This is going to sound really silly, but um, you know, back to what Julie was saying, you know, after you interview, do you know how many people never send a thank you note? It's really shocking, and it used to be just that you would never consider having an interview without sending a thank you note. And uh, I'm continually amazed at how many people don't. And it's such an op missed opportunity because you have an opportunity to reflect on how the discussion went, to emphasize things that you can tell that now that they're interested in based on the conversation, to add in a point that you may have forgotten to add in during, it's, it's just that opportunity to sort of cinch everything and uh, send thank you notes. Even if it's by email, that's fine. Once in a while I get a handwritten one and that's just awesome. But um, <laughs> most people don't do that and it's not expected. But if there's two really strong candidates and one's had a and then if you get the job don't work don't expect to work 40 hours a week if you if you're the person who's leaving at 4 4 30 or 5 on a regular basis ready to get out there and enjoy your social life in dc you're not the person who's going to get promoted although work-life balance is important <laughs> absolutely yeah. What, what we can say is that your deliverables should be fantastic and excellent, right? As opposed to the time thing. Yes. We, we're all trying to be more understanding of that and to not drive what we used to call heroism in the job, right? Presenteeism. Yeah, or presenteeism. Well, there, there are two aspects of the same thing. One is you're sitting there. The other is we expect you to drop dead sitting there because, no, you know, you don't have to do that. So we've run out of time, but I have not got to ask my favorite question yet. So I think we're going to have one more question and then take just two questions from the audience. So this question is like lightning round question and it kind of has two parts. You can choose what you want to say. Either what was the greatest obstacle in your career and how did you overcome it or just any sort of closing words before we go into questions that you want to share you haven't gotten to yet. Um, 
I don't, I don't have anything. Um, I think I really like what you were saying actually about being whole. Um, just, I believe in us showing up as our whole selves. Um, and I, I know that there are a lot of rules that folks feel the need to follow. Um, I bridge generations for what it's worth. Uh, and so I can appreciate the kind of the standards and practices from yesteryear and yet, um, it's a new day. Um, and I think we have to think and do differently in that regard. Oh, and I did think of something as I was babbling. So <laughs> global health, I think the silos no longer serve us in global health. And so the more that we can think across issues and even beyond global health into development, the smarter we are and the better we'll do at the work. Okay, that's better, thanks. So two quick things. Um, the first would be, don't be afraid to take an internship. Actually, USAID Global Health hires um, MPH level internships, even PhD level internships. Sometimes I think those who want to get their foot in the door are concerned that, you know, they don't want, they want, want to graduate from an MPH and they want to, even if they have field experience, they feel like an internship is maybe not the right level or role for them. A lot of people come in through an internship, get hired on into a more permanent and, uh, um, meaning maybe role in which was originally the intent. So don't be afraid of that. And, and maybe the second thing is, um, and this is maybe life, um, not just for career advice, but relationships, um, building strong relationships across organizations, across, uh, it, 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 I mean, within a bureaucracy like the federal government and USAID, relationships are so key to be able to be successful and get things done. But I think with partners, um, with our um, partner country, um, host country counterparts, et cetera, those relationships are what help us be successful in, in having impact um, with the dollars that, our taxpayer dollars that fund the work that we do. Um, so um, always remember respect and, and build those relationships because you'll be able to lean on them um, at all different points in time in your career. Um. I'm also blanking on the barriers, um, not that there weren't any, but rather it was um, things opened up based on a long career. Um, I would say more of the enablers uh, we haven't talked about, and we have sort of alluded to it, is that because we are representing the American people, and your and mine tax dollars, we are health diplomats. And health diplomacy is the ability to have the relationships, have the knowledge, have the behavior, have the skills. Uh, it really is a multi-dimensional opportunity. And the more that you can see yourself in that way, I think it would be great for you. I won't repeat the wise words of the colleagues who spoke before. I thought all said excellent things. Um, I think my career has been a little bit different in that I spent 17 years, well, the bulk of my career living overseas. Um, so if you, one of the things I would say that I learned during that time is just how interesting, um, what an interesting life experience it is to live overseas and do the work firsthand and um, raise a family while doing that. And I look back and I say, I wouldn't have done it any other way. So if you're interested in living overseas, which some of you may be, if especially you returned Peace Corps volunteers, you may say, huh, I did this for a couple of years as Peace Corps. Maybe I want to do it for, as a career. I'd say, go ahead and do it. It's an amazing way to spend a career. Um, but the way to do that is to take a job. The, it's difficult to get those opportunities. When I was your age, it's kind of funny to say that because, well, funny how you get to this point in life, you say, well, when I was your age, I remember my grandparents saying that, even though I'm not the age of my grandparents. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, there were a lot more opportunities. You could start as an intern and then become a project manager and then become a deputy director and then become a director and then a regional director. That, that career path is, that I had and that I had the opportunity to have is no longer available to you. So my career path doesn't exist anymore for many good reasons, including the uh, that many of those jobs are now held by health of a um, um, host country nationals. And that's a great thing. And I'm so glad the world's moved in that direction. However, it's closed off a whole kind of career track that's no longer available. So for those of you who'd like to have that opportunity, 
The way to do it is A, speak a language because you'll get an opportunity to go places. And the other way to do it is to go places that are difficult to live. So there's still opportunities to work for companies like the International Rescue Committee, five of the best years I ever spent in my career, um, and live in difficult places like like deepest, darkest DRC, like South Sudan, like the Central African Republic, live in the difficult places, Chad, um, live in difficult places because once you've done that, the next opportunity will be easier to get. So that's for those of you who want an international career. Um, so I wanted to go back to the question of silos that Lois mentioned and I mentioned earlier and there are a lot of different kinds of silos and for my entire career, I've really focused on trying to break those down, but it has been an obstacle in, in many ways because, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've worked across reproductive health and HIV. Um, I've worked across programs and research and wherever I am, you know, if I'm in an HIV group, I'm the family planning person. If I'm in the family planning group, I'm the HIV person. If I'm in the re research organization, I'm the program person and it goes on and on. And, it's actually been an obstacle in some cases when I've been looking for jobs, not because um, it should be that way, but, but these silos are still an unfortunate reality. And it's not the trend, it's not the way we should be doing our work. We should be thinking in comprehensive ways and integrated ways and health systems ways. But you know, as, as recently as last year, I was told that I wasn't, um, really a family planning person, even though I worked in family planning organizations for 15 years. Um, so uh, be aware of the silos. They, they can be hard to overcome. Thanks, guys. I don't think we're going to have time for questions, but I want to thank our panelists. And I also want to give a big thank you to Recessions Bar. Um, they have a long-standing relationships with Peace Corps. So if you hadn't gotten a drink, if you haven't gotten food, please do so. They've been very supportive of our events. And then Brad, is that if you are interested in a job, Brad um, works for ICF and they're hiring people on the demographic and health survey program. So if that sounds interesting to you, talk to Brad. They're looking for people. Um, and I think we're out of time, but thank you everyone for coming out and uh, Let's give a big thank you to all of our speakers.